Okay, a few things before we start. Number one, this is a two-parter list. I have 15 books that I want to talk about, and if I want to try and cover all of those books in as much detail as I want to, then we're going to be here all day, so two parts. Number two, I am aware that something like this can come off as kind of patronizing. A white person talking about black women writers can have a patronizing edge to it, and of course that is not my intention, but I am aware that it can definitely come across that way. This is a channel and website that promotes all writers that are not cishet white men. Books in translation, books by minority ethnic people, people of colour, queer writers of all types, and recently I've read a lot of great fantastic, life-changing books by women of colour, specifically black women writers, and I want to talk about them. So I've put them into a big list. You can read an article on our website that has the same list on it, and this is a two-parter video covering some of my favourite black women writers that I've read recently. These are modern black women writers from the UK, US, and Canada. Let's go. First up is the one that I read most recently. I got it from the library, that's why it's shiny. This is Transcendent Kingdom by Ya Gyasi. It's really great. Transcendent Kingdom had a lot of hype behind it, and it feels like it's kind of inspired by her own life. It treads a lot of the same ground, literally, that she has trodden. It's about a family from Ghana moving to the US, which is her story as well. It's about a person who goes to Stanford University, which she did as well. And it's about family ties and family relationships. It's about science versus religion. It's a book that moves back and forth between the past and the present very freely, willy-nilly, as it sees fit. And the present is our protagonist, whose name is Gifty. She's around 30 years old, and she is a neurobiologist. She is doing her PhD at Stanford University. She spends all of her time at a lab putting wires into the heads of lab mice. Her mum is coming to visit, and her mum has had very, very terrible mental health issues for a long, long time. She's been suffering with depression. She barely talks to people. She spends all her time in bed, and it seems like this has been her state for years now. And the reason why is because when Gifty was a child, her older brother, Nana, died of a heroin overdose. This isn't a spoiler. The book travels back and forth through time. And the fact that it isn't a spoiler, the fact that this is established very, very early on, even in the blurb, makes it clear that this is not a story about twists and turns. This is a story where everything is laid out on the table, and what we're looking at is reasons why. We're building a jigsaw out of all the pieces that we can already see. And it's really incredible. It's about the migrant experience in the 20th century. The fact that this is a family who moves from Ghana. The wife goes first, followed by the husband. The husband ends up going back to Ghana because he can't stand it. He leaves his entire family behind. And then you've got an eldest son who is a sports prodigy. He starts out playing soccer, then basketball when he reaches six foot at the age of like 12. And then eventually he slowly falls into opioids and dies of a heroin overdose. Gifty, meanwhile, is the only one left that ends up finding some kind of success in the United States. She becomes a scientist. Her mum falls into religion. When they first arrived in the US, a lot of racism. They were poor, they were struggling to find work and support themselves and survive in this new place that was not very welcoming to them. And she finds religion, she finds solace in the local church. It's interesting how religion is kind of the main focus of this book. It's about her mum loving Christianity. There's a good and a bad side to it. Her mum loves the church and she finds solace and most importantly community at this church, but then she forces her children into this religious box. And that is kind of partly what destroys the family, as well as being a migrant family in a country that is not welcoming, etc, etc. But religion plays a large part in that. And Gifty instead, as she grows up, she moves into science, and she's trying to use science as a way to explain her big brother's trajectory that he moves on before he dies. She wants to understand addiction, and addiction is her main study. It's absolutely fascinating, this blend of science and religion, this family dynamic, this doomed migrant experience that isn't entirely doomed, but the world is not on their side. It's really incredible, and it does so much in about 200 pages. Also, this is a book that's written so well that it feels like a memoir. 
it has so much rich dialogue and it feels so intimate that you struggle to believe that it's fiction at all. It really feels like a memoir. It really feels like Gifty is a completely real person and you feel all of her tragedy so heavily. It is utterly and beautifully written. There is nothing like it. Transcendent Kingdom deserves all the hype that it's getting. It's one of the best books of this year. Don't miss it. All right, I'll try not to talk about the other books with as much uh, detail and enthusiasm, but we'll see. And actually that might be quite easy with this one because the next book I'm gonna talk about is quite hard to nail down, and that is Assembly by Natasha Brown. Another book that I read very recently, Natasha Brown is a black British woman writer, and Assembly is her debut novel. It is tiny, it is exactly 100 pages, it's a slender little thing, and it is very, depressing in a multitude of ways. It is a book that is very poignantly about the quiet side of racism in the UK, a country that prides itself on not being racist, which of course is nonsense. And it's about how racism is so embedded in our social behaviors that we don't even notice it. In the workplace, on the street, in families, in relationships, these things are embedded we have internalized racism and people get angry if they get told that I'm not racist, blah, 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 but you are because it's everywhere. And Assembly really explores that. It tells the story of a young black woman in London who has found a really good amount of success in an investment banking firm, which is a phrase I find really hard to say. She's going out with this white guy who is from old money, a Tory conservative family who have a big house out in the countryside. It's primarily, especially in the second half, about them going to this house for a big family gathering of white people wearing polo shirts and drinking wine and talking about things. It's about the systemic racism within this country and examples of the racism that our protagonist sees every day at work being kind of the token black person, being used as an example of diversity or being a spokesperson for diversity. And it goes even further than that in the little conversations between her and her boyfriend, the way that she frames her boyfriend and his life, the struggles that he has that aren't really struggles. It goes on and on and on and racism is always at the heart of it. She also has just been diagnosed with something really, really terrible and she's trying to battle that. And as a hypochondriac, I found it really difficult to read, but also still necessary and interesting. There's a lot going on in 100 pages. This is one of the smartest books that I've ever read. And it's also written in a very literary style in these tiny little vignettes. The chapters are tiny. Some of them are just half a page. So it's 100 pages long, but it's not walls of text. So it's less than 100 pages, really. Uh, it's tiny little vignettes that almost come across as tiny short stories or bits of poetry. It's it's very scattered. It is abstract, almost. Easy to follow, but there's an abstract sense to its form and format. I found that really engaging. Assembly is absolutely worth your time. You'll read it in a single sitting, it'll take you an hour, and it will change everything. Another book that I read recently and I actually don't have on me is The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. I have talked about this book already. It left a huge impact on me, and it was one of the biggest books of 2020 when it came out. Everyone was talking about it, you could not get away from it, and rightly so. The Vanishing Half has really stuck with me right up until today, months after I read it. I really loved this book. It's the only Brit Bennett book that I've read to date, but I am interested in reading her other stuff, because of course, Vanishing Half is amazing. If you haven't read it, The Vanishing Half is about twins, who are both girls, and when they're around 16 years old, they decide to leave their strange, tiny little town in the Deep South, to try to carve out their own path. The town that they grew up in is an entirely black community, and first they arrive in New Orleans, and then they kind of separate and begin to live their own lives, and the book follows those two tracks. The one sister becomes black, for lack of a better description. She moves to Washington DC, she marries an abusive black man, has a child, and ends up moving all the way back home to her small town, moving back in with her mother, and she's right back where she started. The other sister becomes white. She marries a white man in suburbia, in California, and lives a very privileged middle-class life where she hides the fact that she was ever black and ever lived in a black community. It's really incredible. It's looking at the division of class and race in American society through the 20th century and right up till today. It also has a fantastic trans character in it, really good trans representation, which I love to see, and it follows the children 
of these characters as well, the two sisters and their two children. There's so much richness going on here, and the way that the two stories interweave, and the past and the present come up to meet each other, it's so well plotted and executed. I really adored The Vanishing Half, it is exactly as good as everyone says it is, and you should not pass it up. If you haven't read it yet, please do. You probably already have, because so many people have, and we all know why it is such a fantastic novel. The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, please check it out. Another great American novel that I read recently, which I did a whole video review on and I've mentioned it since in a few videos because it was really important to me, was one of the first books of this year that I read and reviewed. It came out in January and that is Luster by Raven Leilani. Luster is great. Oh, it's really great. I don't know where I put my copy. It must be here somewhere. Luster tells the story of a young woman in New York City who ends up falling into a relationship with a married middle-aged white man who lives in suburban New Jersey. The two of them have this interesting dynamic between them, but what makes the dynamic more interesting is when we get introduced to his family, his white suburban wife and their adopted black daughter who is living in white suburbia and doesn't have any black role models until our protagonist comes along and actually starts living with them even though he's cheating on his wife with her she becomes part of their household and forms a kind of friendship with this white housewife and becomes a role model for their black daughter. It's a fascinating book, again very very short, I think it's less than 200 pages and I really loved it. You can go watch my whole video review on it. I really adored Luster, it made the short list or the long list for the women's prize for fiction, 2021, and rightly so. Oh, Luster is great. I like how conversational its tone is, it feels very nonchalant, it has very, very modern sensibilities, it feels like a book written by today, about today, for today. It has pop culture and video game references, which is really endearing. I loved Luster. It's charming, it's funny, it's poignant. There are some really hard-hitting moments about racial diversity in 21st century America. It's topical, while also just being a very, very engaging and lovely story. Definitely, definitely check out Luster. For this half of the video, I have three books left to talk about, but I read all three of them quite a while ago. One of them I am on the edge of rereading, and that is The Confessions of Franny Langton by Sarah Collins. Sarah Collins is a London-based author whom I have had the privilege of meeting and talking to, and she's just such a wonderful person. Right now, she is turning Franny Langton into a TV series. She's been tweeting about it a lot. The rights to the book got bought, and she got to write the script for it as well, so I don't think she's the showrunner, but she is the writer. The Confessions of Franny Langton is a historical novel, and I love historical novels, and it tells the story of the titular Franny Langton, who is a woman who grows up in the Caribbean. It's set in the mid-19th century, I think, and she grows up in the Caribbean, she learns to read and write there, and she ends up moving to London and becomes the maid to a wealthy family. But the framing device is the fact that the wife of this family has died and Franny Langton is on trial for her murder. Did Franny do it? If she did, why would she? Because she and this woman were very, very close. It's fascinating. Of course it's about racism, of course it's about the lives of black British women in the 19th century, but it's also a really beautiful and engaging piece of historical fiction. It's a fantastic mystery story that gets unwoven bit by bit, and it's also a book full of very unlikable characters, Franny included. And this was something that I saw a few people argue about when the book came out, is that there aren't really any good people in Franny Langton, and that doesn't matter. I absolutely hate this conversation, I think it's very silly. You don't have to like a character to like a character, it's <laughs> silly. Anyway, The Confessions of Franny Langton is really fantastic. It has become more popular as time has gone on. When it came out in hardback, I didn't see a lot of attention for it. I got it when it came out in paperback. I have it here somewhere. Where is it? I think it's behind Bimini. Sorry Bimini, I won't move you. I loved it. Sarah Collins signed my copy when I met her. Ah, oh, it's just lovely. I'm gonna reread it now because I've forgotten so many of the finer details of this book. I'm gonna reread it and I might do a whole video just revisiting Franny Langton and why it's such a fantastic modern novel by an incredible black British woman writer. 
Next is An American Marriage, which I read on my Kindle, so I don't have it. Not that I <laughs> have had half of these books here, because I lose them, and as I said, Franny Langton is trapped behind Bimini here. Anyway, American Marriage, I read it at the start of lockdown in March 2020, and it was a really lovely, comforting book. An American Marriage tells the story of a kind of middle-class black couple in modern America, and the husband ends up going to jail for something he didn't do, and a lot of the book is letters being passed back and forth between the two members of the couple while he's in jail and she's struggling to live a life by herself. And the letters are really, really charmingly written. The only weird thing about An American Marriage is that it's written in this kind of formal tone. The characters speak like they are colleagues rather than a couple. There's this sense of distance and stiffness to the dialogue, and even the, the descriptions and everything, it, it's got a stiffness to it, which I thought was weird, but apart from that, it's a fantastic book. An American Marriage is written by Tayari Jones, who brought out another book recently this year, and I kept seeing it everywhere in bookshops, but no one was really talking about it, and I haven't read it, but I really enjoyed An American Marriage. I, I think it's a great book. It's very, very poignant and topical. A black man being sent to jail for a crime he didn't commit is very, very topical. But it's also more about the marriage between the two of them, and so it's relevant to the racial conversation in modern America, while also being a very engaging story about a marriage on the rocks, falling apart, trying to survive something that most marriages probably couldn't survive. It's interesting in a lot of different ways. As I said, the writing style is a bit weird, and clunky, but the content and context and story really carries it forward. And the last book that I want to talk about is the only Canadian novel on this list, and that is Washington Black. Washington Black is a lot of fun. It's written by Canadian author Essie Adujan, and I loved every single page of Washington Black. It's another book I haven't got on me. I think I'm sure it's at my parents' house. Yes, it is, because I read it while I was visiting them. Anyway, that's not important. Washington Black is a fantastical ish historical novel. It tells the story of a young boy on a sugar plantation in the Caribbean, and the plantation is run by this one white guy. The white guy's brother is this strange and quirky inventor character, kind of a Doc Brown type, and he invents these wacky machines, and he helps Washington Black by asking for Washington Black's help. The two of them work together to create this flying machine to escape the plantation together and end up going on an adventure. They journey across North America, and I think they end up somewhere in Africa. I can't quite remember how the book ends, which is probably a good thing I shouldn't talk about it here, should I? I read it as soon as it came out, which was now about two or three years ago, so I'm a bit hazy on the details, but Washington Black is so much fun. It's an adventure novel, it's an historical novel, it's a novel about racism because it's about a boy who is born and raised as a slave on a sugar plantation who ends up finding freedom, but it's also this kind of companion buddy story between Washington Black and the strange white inventor guy who helps him escape because he needs his help, so it's got this symbiosis between them, but they end up being pretty good friends. It's charming. It's just a really lovely adventure story. I don't have a lot to say about it because it's been a while since I read it, but it is a book that isn't being talked about much anymore. There was a lot of hype around it when it came out, and then it kind of went a bit quiet, but if you missed it, if you haven't read Washington Black yet, and you want a charming piece of historical fiction, a lovely adventure story, this is absolutely worth your time. Washington Black is a darling novel. I really, really enjoyed it. Okay, that's the end of part one. Part two will come soon, and I have seven or eight more books to talk about in that list as well. I hope this wasn't too long. That was the whole point of it. We'll see. Anyway, look out for part two, and I'll see you soon. Subscribe for books.